Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar titled Rethinking Renewables, Reliable and Cost-Effective Collection Solutions, sponsored by Hendrix Area Cable Systems. I'm Martha Davis. I'm the Editorial Director with TND World, and I'll be your moderator today. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please put your questions in the questions window and our technical experts will be able to help you out. We recommend disabling any pop-up blocking software or extensions in your browser as those can cause issues with the webinar player. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. We'll answer as many questions as possible during the webinar and during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. But feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your questions into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and it will be available on the TND World website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have Brian Traeger, uh, who is, uh, works for Techno Technology and International with uh, Marmon Utility. LLC. Brian is a member of the IEEE. He received his BS and Master's of Engineering degrees in Electrical Power Engineering uh, from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York in 1979 and 1980, respectively. He also has a Master's degree in Business Administration from the University of Pittsburgh in 1986. Mr. Traeger has held various positions in engineering, consulting, and management at, at American Electric Power Company, Cooper Power Systems, and Fisher Pierce, and at H Hendrix Wiring Cable, where he's been for the last 26 years. He's taught electrical power engineering at Ohio State University, West Virginia University, and Pennsylvania State University. In addition to teaching courses to utility clients, he has authored over 50 technical papers and articles for the IEEE and other national and international organizations. He has brought to fruition numerous high reliability power distribution projects in various sites on seven continents over a period spanning more than 40 years. And with that, Brian, I'll turn everything over to you. Great. Thank you for that quick introduction, preamble, theory of operation, configuration components. We'll get right into it. We'll talk about what are the benefits in wind farm facilities, what are the benefits in solar ranch facilities, and then uh, try to summarize with the principal determining factors. When is space cable a preferred alternative, or, or when is underground or bare wire the preferred? Quick intro. We've been around since 1951. Space of Cable is not new. We've had started 5, 15, 25, 35, 46, 69 KV. We've been in 69 uh, for over 25 years. We introduced 115 KV in 2019. We're on all seven continents, including Antarctica, over 75 countries. It's a company that's got continuous development, continuous R&D, continuous improvement, and we're installed for reliability economics, safety, and again, we say it's not for everywhere, but it is a design option that has benefits in certain applications. For the preamble, I, I call this kind of a 20th century paradigm. Um, when you took a, take a look at medium voltage collection systems at renewable facilities, whether they be wind, solar, or, or other, for the most part, they've been constructed using either bare wire, overhead lines and with underground cables. And, and when you look at the reason for this, uh, there's been a logical solution being bare wire underground cable for the vast majority of renewable facilities. And it's due to the fact that 90%, I say 90%, it's probably 90, 95% of those facilities in the U.S. are relatively small. They might be 100 kilowatts, 500 kilowatts, one megawatt. I'm saying they're under 100, but the vast 95, 96, 97% of these facilities are under five megawatts. And as an electrical design engineer, if you look at a one megawatt facility with a 34, five KV collector system, you bring it back 18 amps. So even if you've got a, even if you have a five megawatt facility, you've only got 90 amps. I mean, you can bring that in with an overgrown extension cord. So, um, you know, one or two 35, 
KV collectors can handle the entire output of 95% of these facilities with just a single collector. So as the size of those renewable facilities grows, so does the collection needs. So we've gone from one to five megawatt solar facilities to 500, 600, 700 megawatt facilities. And as the complexity of those collection systems grows, um, the complexity of construction also uh, grows. To, you know, where to put the collectors and what costs they reflect uh, also increases dramatically. So for these medium to large facilities, and when I say medium to large, I'm talking 100, 150 and up megawatts, aerial, spacer, cable offers a convenient, reliable and cost-effective solution to this design uh, scenario. Very briefly on, on theory or components, if you will, space cable is a heavily covered, non-shielded phase conductors held together and supported by a high-strength messenger cable. And you can see the messenger up there. It's, it's got several functions, it's a mechanical support member. It holds everything up in the air. Um, it's also your, your ground, your neutral, your lightning shield, and it also holds everything off that may fall on that bundle from up above. You can see the spacer there. We've got one spacer every 30 feet, every nine meters, um, and that's basically to hold the phase conductors on to the messenger. Those phase conductors have no tension in them. It might be 100, 200 pounds of tension. It's just like hanging a shirt up on a, on a hanger in your closet. Uh, there's no tension on those phase conductors. Now we have a couple of other components, the spacer. We've got a couple of brackets, tangent, angle, dead end bracket. And essentially, that's it. It's an extremely simple, compact, low profile system. Okay, so. Let's, let's start with wind farm applications. Why, why would we use space cable in a wind farm application? Uh, for starters, it's where top, topography or soil conditions are unfavorable for bare wire or underground systems. You know, we might have a ridge line system or something like this. We want to avoid drilling land, drilling rock, mountain for underground, or, or avoid problems with bare aerial systems. Uh, we're going to have reduced total costs. We're able to put multiple circuits uh, all on one pole. And we're going to avoid conductor clashing. Um, we know that with wind farms, conductor clashing is the number one cause of outages in this wind farm. So it leads not only to loss of reliability, but massive loss of, of megawatt output and revenue. Um, and, you know, we, at wind farms, we expect high winds. So it's not, it, it's something we learned after the first several years of uh, large wind farms, but it's, it's significant. And with space or cable, you don't get conductor clashing. And if you do, there's no outages. We're also using it when we have right of way limitations, when we have a narrow right of way, or it's a, it's a narrow right of way because they won't allow us to remove the trees. We know we're going to get improved voltage regulation. We're going to have 15 to 20 percent better voltage support compared to bare wire systems, and this is going to lead to lower cost feeders because we're going to end up buying less aluminum. We're going to have vastly improved reliability, less outages, lower costs, and, and more revenue from megawatt production. And lastly, it's going to be environmentally friendly. We're going to avoid removing trees and we're going to avoid uh, long term tree trimming. So there's going to be some cost reductions and, and minimization of foliage disruption. We're going to protect the birds, the ground animals from electrical shock hazard. And it's also going to be entirely applic compliant, which is a big thing for our, our Western uh, clients. <laughs> And I'll just show you a couple here. Um, I don't know how many of these projects we've done, but um, well over 50. There's a Green Mountain Power in Searsburg, Vermont. You can see clearly uh, the strings are underground cable. Uh, we want to worry about throwing ice off of these blades in the winter. 
uh, but 100% of the collectors are spacer cable. Um, here's, a, here's one of the many jobs we did with Eber Droll, and now it's called Avon Grid Renewables. This is up, uh, this is what we would call a ridgeline uh, wind farm up in Lempster, New Hampshire. The, the, the turbines are suitably arranged along the ridges, and then we're bringing power down to the substation to get it back on the grid. And this is what that is going to look like. So, um, you know, we just used the existing uh, pole line going up to the mountain there, and we just put our collector circuits on it. So it's very uh, compact, low profile, and, and non-invasive, not intrusive. So I'm talking about ridgeline, um, ridgeline wind farms, which is the majority of the wind farm applications that call for spacer cable. But we also have several flat terrain wind farms. Here's a series of projects we did with a company called Noble Environmental, and these are four wind farms scattered over, oddly enough, four counties. So most of the strings here from those individual turbines to the collector circuits most of those strings uh, were underground cables. Some of them were spacer cable. 100% of the collection circuits were spacer cable. So here we used the 556 KC mill, and we put between eight and I want to say 12 or 13 1.5 megawatt turbines on each collector. Now we could have gotten a lot more megawatts on each collector, but these ran several miles, so they were concerned for voltage law, voltage drop, and losses. But we can get into that when we help you uh, design these facilities. And I said strings versus collectors. Some of the strings in that wind farm were spacer cable, and that was because we were trying to uh, minimize the foliage and the tree removal uh, between those individual turbines and the 34.5 kV collector circuits. There's another job we did. This is a, what we call old growth in New England. This is Berkshire Wind Farm uh, up on Mount Greylock. So the, some of those strings were, were underground cable. All the collectors were spacer cable. And here's another nice job. This is City of Summerside uh, on beautiful Prince Edward Island. So that was, uh, I guess, it was a small 12 megawatt farm with. Uh, uh, might have been 16, and we used 336, 35kV. And this is, again, this is more of a typical uh, ridgeline uh, ridge wind farm uh, we did with Gamesa, and it's called Sandy Ridge Wind Farm, and all of those collectors were, were, ran, were run down the ridge. So this was an interesting job. And some other smaller jobs, steel winds to Lackawanna, this is another Iberdrola avant grid uh, we did in, in Groton, New Hampshire. Again, this is another ridgeline uh, wind farm where all the turbines were up on top of the ridge or ridges. Again, one more avant grid Iberdrola. This is called Huzak wind farm. This is on the on the on the border of Massachusetts and Florida in upstate New York. So that was a fun job. So that's great for for wind farms. How about solar energy? Why why would anyone want to consider using spacer cable in a solar energy application? Well, we take a look at uh, you know topography or soil conditions. You know, solar installations they're usually on relatively flat ground. There are a few technical obstacles to installing either bare wire or underground cable. Um, how about space and right-of-way limitations of these uh, of solar applications? A key issue with solar installations is the availability of land. It's normally expensive, and shockingly expensive, and, and furthermore, every square foot of land required for a power line is a square foot of land not available to put up panels. So again, you know, we're competing with collection systems versus panels, uh, which is which seems crazy. And when we talk about multiple circuits, you know, underground circuits suffer high derating. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But even small loads require massively large conductor sizes because of the warm soil, there's no cooling, and the heat entrapment. Underground cables uh, at these solar facilities routinely suffer up to 60% ampacity derating. 
Well, we say we'll go to we'll go to bare wire. We love bare wire, but that requires a lot of state, space because I can only get two circuits on a pole. Yeah, I maybe get three circuits on a pole, but nobody will work on it. And for spacer cable, we can put all of the circuits on pole, whether that's two, three, four, 10, 15, what have you. So there are no limitations in terms of spacer cable. Uh, I'm trying to find my mouse there, sorry about that. Also with the solar applications, we're gonna avoid conductor clashing where bare wire systems are very prone to outages with conductor clashing. We're gonna have that improved voltage regulation, 15 to 20% better voltage support compared to bare wire. Um, again, we're gonna save money on aluminum. Reliability, less outages, lower costs, more revenue for megawatt production, reduced total costs. And lastly, we're gonna say it's environmentally friendly. We're gonna remove, avoid removing trees, not that many trees in the desert, but we're gonna avoid removing whatever trees we have, as long as that long-term tree trimming cost reduction and minimization of foliage disruption. And, and I, I guess that was a little flip about saying, well, there's not that many trees in the desert. I, you know, recently we were talking about a, 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 a solar ranch in the desert and they have to, it's not so much avoid them, but trees are protected absolutely protected you can't move them uh, so it's kind of interesting but we're also going to protect birds we're going to protect ground animals from electrical shop hazard and it's going to be again applic compliant we're going to be able to put multiple circuits on a single pole oh here's the savings and i'm going to just blurt through these now and we'll go through them in in intricate detail later but multiple circuits on a pole, we're gonna have savings compared to underground due to massive derating of those cables. OPMW, boom, we're gonna put the fiber right in the messenger, save five foot on the pole. We're gonna connect directly to the substation bus rather than having those costly and messy uh, underground substation exits. We're gonna use less right of way for collector circuits, which means we're gonna free up real estate for panels or turbines, and we're gonna have savings related to improved voltage regulation. Uh, again, we're gonna have lower voltage drop, and therefore we're gonna be buying less aluminum, and we'll I'll get into that in a bit. I'll just uh, riffle through a couple of these installations. We've done, I wanna say, 25 to 30 mega facilities, and I always say mega facilities, I mean, 300 megawatts up. Here's first solar topaz, that's 550 megawatts. That's um, uh, in, in Santa Margarita, California. And I guess that pole has maybe six or seven circuits on it. Uh, here's first solar desert sunlight. Uh, solar Ranchers is now owned by um, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. A lot of these facilities have flipped owners. This is a 550 megawatt uh, facility. We put 50 megawatts in each of 11 collection circuits. And this is running right up to the substation, standing at the substation, looking out, if you will. Um, we've done designs with 14 uh, collectors on one pole line. Uh, here's going back to desert sunlight. This is uh, getting closer to the sub but before we divided it up into two poles so we could enter the substation more easily. Here we've got nine circuits on uh, on one pole line. So that's, so that's 450 megawatts there on one pole line. And we've done a bunch of other projects with First Solar. This is ISEX in, in the Imperial Valley. That's 180 megs. We got that on four, on four collection circuits. Uh, close by to that, we have uh, for Solar Campo Verde uh, in El Centro, and that's 200 megawatts we got on four circuits. Here we've got for Solar McCoy, that's over in Blythe. So that has six circuits. I forget the megawatt. I think that was just over 300. We got that on 1272 KC mill circuits. You can see six circuits on a pole here. Um, kind of a nice job. Here's first solar state line. That's on the state line between uh, Nevada and California. This is during construction. So we had uh, eight circuits in that facility. And then right across the street um, from state line is uh, called first 
solar, silver, state, south, and that's in Prim, Nevada, even though uh, it, it's precisely right on the state line. So those are some real fun jobs that we did that are still cooking away after a decade or more. This is a project we did with, um, uh, the owner was 8-Minute Energy, Mortensen was the EPC, Mount Signal 3. I forget how many collectives we had on there, but we ran one uh, pole line into the sub. So where do we get the cost savings from space to cable at, uh, at, at renewable energy facilities? And, and speaking specifically about solar facilities, well, we're going to first we're going to put all those circuits on one pole. So we'll take a look at that savings compared to underground OPMW going right to the substation bus less right away and the improved voltage regulation. Let's take a look at these one by one. Here's a here's a wind farm uh, that we looked at maybe 15 years ago. Uh, it's called Caribou Wind Farm in New, in, in New Brunswick. Um, they've got three circuits of bare wire. Um, if you look at that, it's a nightmare. Um, I don't know a single lineman who would agree to work on that line. Um, it looked kind of okay when they first built it. First ice storm, uh, this was this whole wind farm was a pile of rubble on the ground. I would imagine it's still in uh, it's still in litigation, but that all came down. Uh, compare that to you know what we're doing. We put the same three circuits on on a, on a pole. Uh, probably less less robust, um, and we've never had a problem with that. And it's very low profile and uh, very easy to work. Um, again, and you know, with bare wire, I say you're limited to cir two circuits per pole. You can put three circuits, like they did in a couple of slides earlier, and you're begging for trouble. Nobody will work on it. With space to cable, there are no limitations to the number of circuits per pole. Eight, nine. 20, whatever you want. This translates to a lower number of poles, reduced pole costs, less real estate required for collection system right-of-way, more real estate available for solar panels, generation and revenue generation. I said before that when we have underground cables at a lot of these solar facilities, we have massive, massive ampacity derating of that underground cable. And so why do we have that? Well, if you see on the top left there, we've got hot desert clients, climates, and they're, they're, they get quite hot. You know, we have design, we have design uh, goals that we have to design for 45C ambient, and the ground is hotter. And then we have high soil resistivity. There is no, there's no ability to dissipate heat into the surrounding soil. That soil rose, in some cases, infinity, which leads to an underground cable inability to dissipate the heat, which ultimately leads to massive derating of underground cable ampacity. So if you take a look at a thousand amp standard 1,000 amp underground cable, that's going to be derated to maybe 400 amps. So I'm buying a 1,000 amp cable, that's good for 400 amps. So that's going to require me to parallel those cables. So if you look at this next slide, if you can see that, this was 10, 11, 12 years ago when we were still building uh, dead end poles outside the substation fence before we, we convinced the designers to go right to the substation bus. You can see you're coming off, I've got a 1033 KC mill spacer cable circuit. And in order to bring that underground, I had to use two 1000 MCM underground cables because of the rate. So that 1033 KC mill spacer cable had more ampacity than paralleled 1000 MCM underground cables. That's 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 a lot of money. That's a, that's a massive uh, savings. The next thing we talked about optical messenger wire. Well, we, uh, all of these facilities we need fiber. We need communications. Here we have the ability to put all of those fiber communications right into the messenger. That's going to lead to saving five feet of pole height, we might save on a second messenger if we can put all the communications in that one messenger. So less pole height means less tower shading on panels, which otherwise diminishes, you know, megawatt production. 
So here is a job we did. Um, this is called Power County out in Idaho. Um, got there after the designer had put the um, ADSS in there. So basically five foot more pole uh, versus our standard um, for solar and other designs where we put all the fiber into the messenger. So it's uh, really simple, really economical, and, and really a, a, a fantastic savings. I said we can connect directly to the substation bus. So underground and bare wire collection systems usually dead on dead end on poles outside the sub. Transition to underground at the riser pole, then and through the substation via an underground cable. These transitions, terminations, dead end poles, burying, uh, boring, et cetera, are very costly. But with space to cable, that collection system goes from the last pole outside the sub directly to the bus. There's no transitions or other costly components. And if you take a look at that, um, here's a job we did years ago. Um, you can see we're coming off the right last pole. We dead ended at the last pole outside the substation fence and just simply run a slack span over to the substation bus. Um, nice, economical, and simple. Here we ran it right to the uh, switch at the substation bus. And I said also that we have um, less right of way for the collection circuit with spacer cables. So for each, you know, if we're looking at underground cable, and this was pretty obvious when I showed you the desert sunlight project, but for underground cable, each circuit has got to be separated by six feet. So for a facility with 11 collection circuits, that translates into 70, 72 feet of right of way required. For spacer cable, the right of way required would be for a single pole line, which requires less than one third of that width. So again, the extra real estate freed up from the collection system right of way is now available for more panels and megawatt production. How about improved voltage re regulation? Compact spacing of spacer cable reduces the impedance by approximately 15%. And this has been covered uh, in previous webinars. If anybody has a question on that, you can send that to me directly. I'd be happy to cover any of these engineering issues in, in, in intricate detail with you uh, personally or, or as a group. For voltage limited circuits, that means the cable size may be reduced by 15%. So this is gonna allow us to uh, select a smaller cable size, which is a massive savings in metal aluminum purchases. Um, so that's a space saving when we're talking about um, comparing space to cable with bare wire. If you're s comparing it to uh, underground cable, it, it's, it's, it's a slam dunk. And I, I just had a, a quick um, chart here on, you know, the pros and cons of space and cable at renewable facilities. When we talk about cost, uh, underground is the highest, space and cable is the lowest, right of way requirement, uh, space and cable is the best, voltage drop, uh, space and cable should be the best. Uh, underground is no problem since you're buying so much aluminum that you don't have much of a voltage drop. Uh, maintenance, I would say probably underground is the best. Uh, space to cable is very low. Bare wire depends if you got conductive clashing, if you will. I would say uh, underground bare wire is certainly the highest um, because linemen won't work on, on energized lines that are bare. Avian protection uh, underground is not applicable because it's underground. Uh, space to cable, it's 100% applic compliant. Bare wire is costly and bare wire is vulnerable because the, because the birds pick that avian protection off of there eventually. Reliability, underground space cable, both extremely high. Uh, bare wire, it depends. Um, fiber optics, I guess you can get it in your underground cable. Space cable, you get it in your messenger. Bare wire, you need it separately and you need a uh, five foot more pole. And again, I talked about, well, you know, bare wire versus underground versus spacer cable at a uh, 
wind or solar or other type of renewable facility, it's going to depend on a couple of factors. The facility layout. Are all uh, collectors coming down a single right of way to the sub, or are they, you know, spread out in the star? Do I have 50 on the right, 50 on the left, 50 below, and 50 on below left? I might have four lines coming in. I may not have a value proposition for space to cable. It might be bare wire or underground. If I have 200 or, or 150 or 250 megawatts laid out a mile from the substation, and all of those collectors are coming down a straight line, Slam dunk space to cable gives you a massive economic value proposition. Collector lengths, are they short, medium, or long? Are they voltage limited? Are, are they, they losses limited, et cetera? These are things we have to look at. Uh, how about collector size? You know, some designers and designing the collectors is 20 or 30 megawatts. Others are trying to push 50 and 60 megawatts. That is going to depend. So these are things we have to look at. Uh, facility size, you know, at some megawatt size, sites are big enough with numerous collectors that the space of cable is significantly lower in cost than other options. So, you know, we've looked at many dozen scores of these projects above 150 megawatts, this is almost always the case um, that space to cable would be have a value proposition. Under 150 megawatt, eh, I have to take a look at it. Take a, a look at the comparisons under underground bare wire space to cable. Site density. Some sites are very, very dense with panels, meaning that there's minimal extra space or real estate for collectors. We've seen some of these sites um, also be expanded. You know, we have um, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five. It's unbelievable how quickly you run out of space. So when we're trenching in underground, it's going to take lots of space, which is better freed up and used either for more panels or for more, more right of way for the next extension, or what we are seeing now in the last year, two years, three years, is we're, we're, we're being asked to say, okay, well, let's put some batteries in those solar ranches. And those batteries take up space, and those batteries require right of way for those collection circuits from the batteries. So, um, yeah, site density is very important in these facilities, and, and it cannot be overlooked, nor, nor myopic concerns for future requirements. Um, yeah, okay, so quick um, uh, summary of 70 years, seven continents, over 75 countries. It's a space cable, it's a collection system of choice for medium to large solar and wind facilities battery facilities. We've got improved reliability, reduced O&M, uh, great economics, reliability, environmental stewardship. It's applic compliant. And uh, I wanted to say that apparently I spoke too quickly. <laughs> I apologize that apparently we'll have more room for questions. Um, but participants of today's webinar may request a certificate of completion uh, to submit to your PE boards for CEU credit. And you can contact uh, Kristen Vanderwall, K Vanderwall at marmonutility.com, and uh, she will get you out a signed certificate of completion. And I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Before before departing, I will hand uh, the microphone back over to Martha Davis, our, um, our moderator, to see if we have any questions. Thanks, Brian. Uh, that was so informative. Um, we do have a lot of really good questions. Um, <clears throat> and um, so for the audience uh, members that haven't submitted a question, if you'd like to, go ahead and type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. And uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, jump right in, um, Brian, to the, to the questions that we already have here. Um, one question that I, I thought was uh, very interesting is, um, someone says they're an EPC uh, and they have zero experience with spacer cable. Do you offer any design, engineering, or field support? Easy question. Yeah. Um, so Martha, we have a we have a very large engineering department. We have a design department. Uh, we have an installation department. Yes, we work with EPCs on a daily basis. 
uh, we can get them up to speed with, you know, whether they're using Spider or, or, or PLS CAD with wire files, um, all the CAD CAM information they need, uh, all the consulting they need. We do complete uh, assistance. We do design review as part of our package. We have um, installation experts, installation specialists on site when it's being reviewed, and we do a uh, complete site inspection when everything is done, which gives you uh, a five-year warranty. So yes, you can you can be an EPC that's never seen spacer cable, and you'll be off and running um, in zero time. Fantastic. <clears throat> Um, another question we have here is from Lee with uh, the Northeast Power um, Coordination. Um, it's cut off on my screen. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Lee. Um, and he wants to know why, uh, why better voltage regulation? Super. Okay. So here we go. <clears throat> when I have um, conductors in an open configuration, my impedance is the resistance, which I can't change, right? That's intrinsic, plus the intrinsic inductance plus the mutual inductance. And the mutual inductance is a function of the configuration of those three phase conductors. As I bring those phase conductors closer together, as in a 12-inch bundle, so as I bring those phase, phase conductors closer together, that mutual inductance goes to zero. If they're touching, the mutual inductance by definition is zero. So I've reduced that mutual inductance so much with a tight bundle that I've decreased my total impedance by 15 to 20%, which means my voltage at the end of the line is 15 to 20% better, which means I can build the line 15 to 20% longer and feed the same load, or I can simply buy a smaller conductor size and save money on aluminum. And, and uh, the individual who asked this question, if you send me an email, I can send you the mathematical formulas and technical papers on that subject. Fantastic. Uh, Lee has another uh, great question here. Um, and he's asking, uh, doesn't the greater the number of circuits pre present, uh, or excuse me, present relay protection problems? Ah, relaying protection. Um, quick answer is no. Um, we would say that there is no difference in protective relaying for spacer cable circuits than there is for bare wire circuits. Okay. And, and, and again, and I've, I've also addressed that. I've also spoken on that uh, protective relaying and spacer cable at another conference. And if he sends me, this questioner sends me an email, I will send them that presentation which expands on that subject of protective relaying and spacer cable. Okay, so fantastic. So Lee, go ahead and, and contact Brian. Um, Brian, he had a, a few other questions too, so that's probably the best way to, to handle those. Um, and then uh, we have a, another question here from Frank with Black and & Veatch, and he's asking um, under what condition or for what sizes, um, megawatt or, uh, KVA, do underground collection systems start to be preferred? Good question. I would say, for me, I would, uh, even though, <laughs> even though we sell a billion dollars of underground cable a year, I would say I would never prefer underground cable unless it was really small. Um, so I, I would I would have to look at the configuration. I would say probably maybe if you're under 100 megawatts and and your and your power blocks are spread out, yeah, you might want to bring those back either with bare wire or underground cable. Um, but I would have to see the layout of the facility and and make an engineering determination on how I would do each configuration and the economics of each configuration. Thank you. Hey, um, Lee, uh, the one that was uh, that you had asked to email you, Brian, um, is asking uh, what's the best email address? Yes, you can see Kristen's email address up there. Mine would be B as in Brian, T 
T. Thomas, R. Robert, A. Apple, G. George, E. Edward, R. Robert, at marmonutility.com. Thank you. Okay, and then we have another question um, from um, Kai at HSB Canada, and uh, they're asking, can you address the requirements of polls now, now that there are multiple circuits on them? Yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, that that is a good question. So you, people always say, "Wow, uh, obviously your stuff is heavier than bare wire." So do I need to go up a pole class? And the answer probably is usually no. But it's it's possible that if I have one circuit on a pole and um, one is three thirty six bare and the other one is three thirty six spacer cable, if I'm in a region where I have ice or snow or wind, yes, I may need another pole class. So once I get three, four circuits on that pole, am I going to need a higher pole class? Absolutely, positively. Um, you know, we're still putting three, four, five uh, of these circuits on 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 wood poles. Um, the pretty hefty poles, class two, class one, maybe an H one. Uh, when we get up to four, five, six, we're probably going to um, engineered structures, uh, metallic poles. But yes. Pole uh, selection is a consideration. We can help you with that pole selection, or we can work with your structural engineers to either uh, select poles or verify the poles that are selected. Okay, fantastic. Um, the next question here is asking: um, Are the are the conductors and the spacer cable bare aluminum? Yes, the conductors in in the spacer cable are usually double AC, all aluminum, uh, 1350 H19, and that's because we use all aluminum because it has a superior ampacity, it has a lower weight, it may be compacted as well. Um, so yeah, we use double AC packed uh, inside of 300 mils of insulation for 35 kV collection systems. Fantastic. Um, we have a, another question here from um, Devinder, who is retired from Hydra One, uh, asking, uh, what is the estimated cost differences uh, per, per megawatt capacity between bare conductor feeder versus cable feeder? Um, he's asking capital cost or overall cost. Very good question. We, uh, we did an economic study. Yes, um, I did it about 10 years ago for First Solar. And what we did is we... Um, we looked at back in the day we were looking at 40 megawatt collector circuits which we've since blown away um and then we were looking at how we were going to feed those whether it was going to be bare wire or underground underground or space a cable um and i didn't get it per foot uh, we got it it was about i was going to save with space a cable i was going to save about uh, $150,000 per mile over underground, the savings for spacer cable versus bare wire. I forget what it was. It wasn't a lot. It might have been, uh, you know, you know $20,000 per mile. But once I got up to four circuits, it was a, it was a ton of money, maybe, maybe $50,000 a mile. So yeah, it depends on the size of the facility. It depends on how many circuits you have, and it depends on what other concerns you have: site density. Do you have high winds? Do you need to be? Do you need to be have kind of a concern for environmental stewardship? Are you worried about killing birds? Uh, are there trees, etc., etc., etc.? And I know um, some regions are more conscious of environmental stewardship than others. But 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 the the, the gentleman, I, I would also be happy to answer that in more in depth uh, if you contact me via email because it was it's a, a subject that could go on for quite some time. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, another question we have here is um, the greater number of circuits on one pole present contingency problems. Um, you know, in, in terms of of one pole. Um, uh, in terms of loss of uh, circuits or generation, um, and that's that's one contingency. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that, that's that's brilliant. Uh, I, I don't I don't disagree. 
so let's have, you know, and we've had this discussion before. So let's have, say I've got two circuits. Well, I don't want to put those two circuits on one pole because the pole might go down. So I'll have two pole lines, right? How about three circuits? How about four circuits? How about five circuits? Yeah. By the time I get five circuits on one pole, you can be darn sure that pole is robust. Um, and if you see when I showed you photos of five and six and seven and eight and nine circuits on a pole, the chances of that pole coming down are uh, zilch. I mean, you could hit it with a 747 and the pole would probably come down. But besides that, no, that pole is not coming down. Now, if you said, well, okay, I've got, you know, I've got a wind farm out in the bonies. Um, and I've got, you know, a, a, a wood pole right on the right on the highway with four circuits on it, uh, and it's susceptible to being hit by an 18 wheeler. Yeah, then maybe I have a contingency issue, and then maybe I better think twice about either shielding that pole, or making that pole more robust, or you know, just taking that into consideration. But yes. Is reliability with respect to number of circuits on a pole an issue? And how do I uh, design that pole? Is that an issue? Absolutely, positively. Okay. And I, but I but I would add, um, a lot of the, a lot of the people listening to this webinar have probably worked on solar facilities. Um, I don't have a whole lot of 18 wheelers doing 50 miles an hour inside of a solar facility. They're usually pretty um, quiet places, if you will. As a matter of fact, I, I think you got to keep it under five miles an hour to keep the dust down. But anyway, I just threw that in there. Thank you. Oh, great point. Okay, next question is from uh, Michael, and he's with the uh, Star Electric Company of Texas. And he's asking, can you offer a comparison of installation productivity, uh, for example, the distance of line installed per day or week for overhead versus space for cable? Um, yeah, I guess I could, but I would just be waving my hands in the air. We have installation specialists that go out and work uh, with with line crews and, you know, pre-construction meetings and work with line crews. As far as my experience with, with installing spacer cable is that if I've got one circuit, you know, my spacer cable might take, I don't know, 10% longer. If I have two circuits, my spacer cable might take 10% or 5% longer. If I have three circuits, boom, spacer cable takes less time. Four, five, six, anything more than three circuits, spacer cable will require less installation time than bare wire, period. And 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 for, for the gentleman uh, on the call, we can um, get you um, um, a Zoom meeting with our installation experts. And these are folks that have been installing spacer cable for 30 years all over the U.S., all over the world. And we don't give them the easy jobs. <laughs> they don't like easy jobs. We give them the most difficult jobs possible. And we can have our linemen talk with your linemen, and they'll speak the same language. And then after that, you can decide if, of what I said has merit. Fantastic. Okay, so our next question is um, is, is somewhat related. Does space, excuse me, does spacer cable require special equipment for installation? Yes. Okay. So your pull attentioners are the same. Your reel trailers are the same. Most of your pulling equipment are the same. Your linemen are the same. What we're going to need is um, what we call um, stringing blocks. Stringing blocks, we have one stringing block every 30 feet, and they're going to roll along the messenger. They're called roll-by blocks. And the other thing we need is we're going to need a – we could use your sled, but we need a special sled uh, as what we call a lead trolley. And that's going to, you know, going to attach on your bull line on one side, and on the other side you're going to have three socks with your three phase conductors that are going to pull those roll-by blocks or those rolling stringing blocks along the line. Um, all of that equipment is given to either the utility or the contract of the EPC free of charge. Uh, it's just helpful if you return it um, uh, intact. So yeah, does it need some special equipment? You need a little bit of a special equipment. That equip equipment is given to you 
You don't have to pay for it. You just have to return it. And we will have our installation specialists with you every step of the way. Fantastic. Um, it, next question is, is there a limit to the number of circuits you can place on a single pole? Probably, we haven't found it yet. Um, I guess so far we've had 14 circuits on a pole. I've showed you photos of, I guess, nine circuits on a pole. Uh, I, I, seemingly, I could get 20 or 30 circuits on a pole. I imagine that pole would start getting tall. Um, we've had, uh, as you've seen from some of those designs, the uh, the uh, the, um, the uh, designers have been asked by the EPCs to keep those poles under a certain height. Why they were asked to keep them under a certain height, I have no idea. But yeah, I mean, if I have a 100 foot pole, I'd have no problem getting you know 20 or 30 circuits on that pole. What I would do, and probably what your electrical design folks would do, they would probably make an H frame structure where they would have you know you know eight on one side or eight on the other and then you know four six or eight in the middle so yeah you could actually a single pole line you could get as many circuits as as you need so is there is there a limit no do i know what that limit is no i don't know okay so it looks like, Brian, um, we're about out of time, and um, that will we'll, we'll conclude today's presentation. Uh, I think we've gotten through most of the questions, and if, if we didn't have time to answer, we'll, we'll get back to you via email. Um, on behalf of T&D World, I'd like to thank uh, Hendrix Aerial Cable Systems for sponsoring today's event, and of course, our audience for joining. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.